in our region, oh God. Let them be places where people learn about truth the way that you have released it from heaven to us. Father, we bless all of our businesses. Come on, lift up your hands. Promotion does not come. Blessing does not come just from the east or the west, but it comes from you. And so we want to see an elevation. We want to see that door to the more open up, the increase that you have in mind for this time. And so we bless every business uh, entrepreneur, every employee, every employer. Father, all those that God are doing kingdom business your way, let them receive grace and creativity. Father, we bless our military community. We speak peace over them, protection, every assignment. Let them fulfill it the way you've called them to. But God, our bases in Eglin, Tyndall, and Herbert around abound us protect them keep them safe let revival winds blow let ones come to know you and let them be blessed as they assimilate back from whenever they're deployed out father we anoint right now our apostolic network for uh bishop and for apostle gail and all those that lead father we speak peace and protection over every church everyone arising to worship you this morning e even throughout the u.s and throughout the nations of the earth because we are a joyful house of prayer for all the nations of the earth and we decree that revival winds are blowing awakening is being loosed in the earth and there will be a great harvest in our generation of those who will come to know your saving grace we bless the nations and we speak the nations from australia and, uh, and new zealand into africa into europe ukraine russia into central and south america north america the Canada, the very isles of the sea, we decree blessings to flow into Polynesia, blessings to flow into Cuba, blessings to flow uh, into places that need it the most right now. And we stand for your grace to flow in an amazing way. We speak peace to Jerusalem and we declare over Israel, we bless you today. And Father, we loose that grace to flow upon those in the midst of conflict, those at home uh, in uh, grief or concern. God, anoint that land and let there be a release of revelation that comes about who you are. And Father, as we were speaking with Max and Julia this week, we know it's a little more dire now than it's ever been before. And so everybody, if you don't mind, we just lift up our hands to you, God. And we're praying for Max and Julia. We're praying for Nipro Christian Center. We're praying for Nipro and all that's happened around about them. For the tens of thousands of ones that have died just recently that they were telling us about. Father, for the things that are there in the land that are so painful and hard for them to even work uh, to see the, the hope come forth. But God, I'm decreeing. Renew them this morning and strengthen all those that have faith. And Lord, as the body of Christ arises, let there be a light in a dark place. And Father, we're thankful for their heart, their passion, their uh, consistency, and their clarity of vision. And contend for them, oh God, and bless them in every form and fashion that they have need of. And let them hear the cry of the saints in the United States, blessing them and standing with them by faith. Father, we bless those that are sent out to do the work of the Lord for Apostles Gail and Shelley. We anoint them as they go over to Pensacola. Anoint their words, oh God. Jimmy and Kristen, as they go to Mobile, oh God, we anoint them to do that work for Apostle Sharon and the team as they prepare to go to Point of Grace and minister to these ladies in need. We anoint them, oh God, and decree grace to flow, strength to come, and the word of the Lord to be upon their lips. We lift up Carlotta and Dr. Faye's sister, Tanya, Lord, and Doug and Marilyn. We just are contending for life, for peace, and for help in their time of need, Lord, for... Uh, Jackie, and Lord, for every assignment against her life, we contend right now, Pastor Tiffany and Wynn and David Monteleon, Lord, we anoint them, and we know your healing virtue works, and so we decree the fervent prayer of a righteous man contends and begins to break through, and it brings the blessings that you want to release, and we're standing with you. We celebrate the newness of life and all that you've given. We give you all the praise. Let's open the gate for the come King in. of Glory to come in. It's a glorious day. Come on, Christians, <laughs> believers, brothers and sisters. There's resurrection life right here this morning, ready to be released to you afresh and anew. This song is all about celebrating the reality of the new life that the Lord has given to us. And I love that it says that when he began to cry out and call out that he knew Lazarus name and he said Lazarus what come forth and at that moment where death reigned life began to be birthed afresh and he began to arise 
out of that grave. Listen, that means God knows your name and he's already called you out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light of his dear son. And so there's a decree of life and life abundantly over you. So take a moment, give somebody a hug and say, God knows your name and give them a high five, give them a hug. Vision Nation, thank you for joining us. We love you. You're here to receive resurrection life. Hey. Now listen, we're a house that believes in the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord brings life. When we attune our ear to what God has to say, it elevates us, it prepares us, and it propels us into God's purposes. Give the Lord a shout of praise. Every praise belongs to you, Lord. This is the year in which I'm going to begin to step out and demonstrate my might and power for my glorious, mighty church. And I am calling those of you who are mine, those who hear my voice, those who have dedicated your life as bond servants to me, I'm calling you to ascend. If this is a year, once I step out, it's a year of transition, day by day, week by week, month by month, and you will enter in to your divine destiny and purpose as you follow me. But you must first determine you will not stop. Be perseverant no matter what, no matter what the cost. Move forward, says the Lord. Come on, turn to somebody, give them a high five and say, I'm going higher, how about you? Hallelujah. Ascending to the high place. Ever since I walked in here today, I kept hearing the Lord say, I'm going to increase your awareness and your consciousness for that which you need in order for you to see the victory in your sphere that you've been praying for. God says, many of you have been striving in prayer. And he says, in this season, you will stop striving and you will enter into the consciousness and into the awareness of what I have already done for you. And he says, know that in this season, the chaos will cease in the midst of you. And he says, the things that the enemy brought up again, and he said, okay, you thought you had gotten rid of that. The Lord says, watch as I bring you into the revelation of the breakthrough that I gave you. And he says, sons and daughters know that now is the season where you allow me to minister to you. He says, allow me to come into your prayer life. Allow me to come into your worship time. Allow me to come into your discussions between marriages, into the discussions between parents. God says, I am going to intervene and I I am going to bring the breakthrough. I am going to bring the breakthrough, he says. He says, this next three months are critical. Allow me to minister to you, my people, because I have chosen you for a great breakthrough. And God says, I will make you the light in your family. I am going to make you the light in the business. I'm going to make you the light in every sphere that you've been praying for. He says, watch as I move on your behalf. For now is the season that I will break through for you, says God. And I don't know, for this uh, gentleman over here in the first row, I heard the Lord say to you, he says, I am breaking things like never before around you. He says, Kevin, he says, son, there are angels assigned to you and your family. He says, there's been some nights you've prayed. There's been some nights you have cried out to me. And he says, watch as I move on your behalf. He says, I am causing the veil of weightiness to come upon you of my glory. And he says, watch as I bring breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough on your behalf. He says, you are my own. You are my son. And I am coming and I am bringing you into the fruitfulness of what I have for you, says the Lord. For this young lady, you're wearing like a bronze sweater. Uh, the Lord says, I am causing chains to be broken off of your family. 
He says, you've cried out day and night, day and night, day and night. And you said, God, are you here? And he says, daughter, I am standing right next to you. I am walking with you in this season. Watch as I move on your behalf. He says, there are troubling things you've heard, troubling things you've seen. But God says, I am your heavenly father. And I am coming now to bring breakthrough for you. So as we praise him today, victory is yours, says God. Victory is yours. Come on, there's something happening in this song. Kevin, as he's ministering to you, I just heard heaven is coming to Kevin. Heaven's coming to Kevin, all right? Now listen, as we're singing this song, I also heard the Lord say, you're gonna, some of you are gonna go from prayer to declare. You're gonna begin to shift into a new authority within your life. This song is all about impartation, realization, and then transformation. And so as we sing this again, some of you, listen, some of you got saying this to you, you know, I'm getting ready. I'm understanding who you are, Lord. Now I'm understanding who you have decreed me to be. I understand who I am in you. The Apostle Paul just said it this way. I am what I am and who I am by the grace of God. God, I'm receiving that grace and I'm stepping up into a new place. And if that's you, that confidence is coming, that authority is being loose. Some of you just need to come to the altar and present yourself to the Lord and saying, this is my way of agreeing with the change, with that, uh, if you will, metamorphosis, that transformation of uh, caterpillar's good, but boy, a butterfly is beautiful and has so many more abilities. Just step up into the altar and just lift up your hands and God's going to endue you as he did on the day of Pentecost. He endued them with fire. He endued them with his presence. He endued them with power in a new level. So God, we want to go higher and we are yes. presenting ourselves now in Jesus. Jesus mighty name by the Holy Ghost. Somebody sing that when I lift my voice. This is the time of breakthrough. Enough is enough of being complacent. Enough is enough of feeling like you're low. Enough is enough of those mind games. If you agree that today that it is enough of enough of being down here, when God calls you to be up here, say amen. Amen. Okay, and here we go. In this time of breakthrough, wants to pour into you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to bring you revelation. He wants to bring you mentorship. He wants to bring you everything you need, but you have to open yourself to receive it. And in that receiving it, he will cause you to rise up like a rising star. A lot of you have spent your life being just burning stars, but you know, eventually you will burn out of energy. Am I right? Have any of y'all felt that? Well, in this season, he said, stop to try to climb the ladder. He said, I already brought the ladder, but upon that, allow me to pour into you so I will be your energy. Stir up that dynamo so you will rise and you will experience the breakthrough without limits. This is the time where there's no more limitations. No more limitations. And if you feel a limitation, that is a lie because in this season, you are rising. Come on, Micah chapter 2 verse 13 declares the breaker has gone up before you. The breaker is going up before you. In the message translation, it says the breaker has gone up before you. He is bursting you out of all confinements. It literally means to break up, to burst out, to burst forth, to break through, to begin to burst out of confinements, to break off limitations. Come on, break the limitations in the spirit. Father, right now, God, we declare every limitation is broken off. We declare every confinement is broken. We declare the breaker. Jesus, you're the breaker. You are champion. You have gone up before us, God. You are opening the heavens. Give the breaker a shout of praise. Come on, see him. He's ascending, and we're with him. Yes, you are. You know, I heard that word out of Isaiah, Isaiah 6, where Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. Close your eyes for a moment, if you will. And I saw his beauty. I saw his glory. I saw his majesty, his train. 
of his robe, it filled the whole place. It filled the temple. And then Isaiah looked at himself and he said, but Lord, I don't feel worthy. I live in a generation that's unclean and I feel sometimes I am too. He said, my lips are unclean and I need you to purge me. Some of you in your own heart, there are things that you say, God, I'm not worthy. This is why I can't ascend. This is what's wrong with me. But God's saying, there's no sin too great. Nothing can separate me from your heart and, and you from my love. God took a coal of fire from the altar of heaven. Heaven came down and a purging release happened. An empowering release happened. Now, all of a sudden, something shifted inside of Isaiah. And he saw the Lord high and lifted up. He saw himself and he wasn't so pleased. But then the Lord did something. And then he said, Lord, okay, I know who I am now. I know who you are and what you've done for me. And so here I am. Send me. Come on, just lift your hands. Ascend so you can be one that God can send. Come on, I hear the Lord saying, ascend so you can be one that I send into a hurt, dark, and a lost world. Father, we lift up our hands to you. You're rising up. We see you. And now you're purging and setting us free and setting us on a path a victory and opportunity to serve you in a new way. We just receive it, that commissioning by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Scripture says, if any man be in Christ, he's become a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. As believers, we need to be reminded that we are new creations in Jesus Christ. I don't care if you've walked with the Lord as long as Bishop Hammond has. We still have to be reminded that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. Old things, say it with me, old things are passed away. All things have become new. Father, we're so grateful for that. Even today, Lord, right now, God, you're making all things new. I want everybody just to shut your eyes for just a second. If you're here this morning and you don't, you've not had that experience of Jesus Christ coming in and becoming your Savior, becoming your Redeemer, becoming the one that washes away the past, that washes away your sin, that washes away the junk, that washes things, the uncleanness, the stuff that's gone on. <laughs> if any man be in Christ, he has become a new creation. Jesus wants to make you a new creation this morning. And if you say, man, I really need that in my life. I need Jesus to come in and be my Savior, to save me from my past. I need a Savior, and you've not received Him as your Savior. I want you to lift one hand high in the air. One hand high in the air. If you say, Jesus, I need you to be my Savior. Anybody here that says, you know what? I've not made this commitment to Him, and I need to do this today. All the blessings we talk about come because He's our Savior. I want us to pray this prayer all over this place. Say it with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus because you love me so much. And you knew I needed a Savior to forgive me of my sin and to make all things new. Today, Lord, I ask Jesus into my heart. I repent. I turn away. I change from the works of the past. But I thank you, Lord, that you have the power to make all things new. Today, Lord, I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you. And I will live for you. Not for myself. Not for my old habits. I will live for you. For this day forward. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, 
Lord says, welcome to the kingdom. Welcome to the kingdom. I want to encourage you, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, before you leave here today, come and have one of the prayer teams agree with you or find Apostle Tom and I. We want to agree with you. We're going to take communion now. So let's just stay in this amazing atmosphere of the presence of the Lord. Communion is such a beautiful act that we do before the Spirit of the Lord. So if you look around you, you'll see that there's a cup on the chair and you just peel it back and you receive it. Communion is worship as well. And it is an act of covenant. The covenant that we received is by and sealed by the love and the blood of Jesus Christ. Even today, sometimes people will cut their finger and mix their blood or, you know, try to say, this is the real deal. I'm really going to stick with you. I'm really in covenant with you. When Jesus shed his blood for you and I so that we could be free. If you want to hold the cup and hold the bread. In Ephesians 2, it says it this way in verse 13 of the Passion Translations of Welcome Vision Nation. Many of you have uh, communion live with us every single day. It says, yet look at, look at you now. Everything is new. Although you were once distant and far away from God, now you have been brought delightfully close to him through the sacred blood of Jesus. You have actually been united to Christ. In the word in Ephesians, it also says when a husband and wife are married, they become one. And it says this is a picture of Jesus and his bride. It's a picture of our life being united to his life. And the decree is you are one. That's why when he ascends, we ascend too. It's a song we sing sometimes here. It says, when he got up, I got up too. That's the power of resurrection life that says that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, when it dwells in you, it will make alive your mortal body and you'll find that it works to bring life again and again. So as we hold the bread, we decree you are the bread of life. By your stripes, we were healed. What you did was sufficient to set us free from the pain and the assignment of infirmity on our lives and the brokenness of our hearts. And we receive the healing that you paid the high price to bring. And we say, thank you. You are the bread of life. Let's partake as one. So that's why this cup is a cup of victory. Because Jesus chose to do it. To fulfill the will of the Father. Not my will, but thine be done. I'm going to endure the cross. Go through the shame and the pain for the joy that's set before me. And I'm going to take the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And I'm going to arise victorious. And I'm going to have a people that will follow me. And they're going to live in that space, that place called grace. Lord, we lift the cup and we decree we are free. But more than that, we receive the inheritance you paid the price for. Let's partake as one with Christ. Can you just say, thank you, Jesus? And turn to somebody and say, we are family. Vision Nation, we are family with you as well online and we're so glad that you are a part with us today amen well we're going to receive our, our morning tithes and offerings it's giving time in the house of the lord let's give the lord a shout of praise amen amen well this is as well a part of our worship when we bring an offering to the lord i was thinking this morning you know in january is kind of that transition month into a new year into kind of a reset season and I was thinking about um, Solomon 
when he transitioned into becoming king over all of Israel. If you need an offering envelope for giving cash, you can lift your hands up. The ushers are walking up and down the aisle. They'll be happy to serve you. We have other electronic ways to give. If you're watching on Facebook, you can hit the Shop Now button. We want to welcome all of those that are watching on our new YouTube channel. So um, everybody, you want, you're going to want to go in and subscribe to our YouTube channel, okay? And if you're watching today, we encourage you to su su uh, subscribe to the channel and become a member if if you feel led. Um, but if you need an offering envelope, they're walking up and down the aisles. I was thinking about Solomon. He had become king. He was David's successor. And you know what? He wasn't in line to become king. His older brother Adonijah was actually in line. But David had promised Bathsheba after they lost their first child that her son Solomon would become the king. And so when David was getting ready to die, um, uh, he said, let's go ahead and coronate Solomon. Here's the problem. Adonijah was already, had already had himself crowned king. So Solomon had kind of a rough start. First thing he had to do was put down the rebellion of his brother and ultimately have him executed because he didn't abide by the, the things that needed to happen. He had to execute David's general, Joab. He had to banish David's priest, Abiathar. He was kind of feeling shaken. Wouldn't you feel just a little bit shaken if that was like your first few days in your new job? And so you know what Solomon did? He brought an offering to the Lord. Not any offering. He offered a thousand bulls. You could say that's a lot of bull, okay? But no, he, 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 brought, he brought a thousand bulls and offered them on the mountain of the Lord. And that night, the Lord came down to Solomon in a dream and he said, Solomon, what is it that you want? Do you realize that your money talks? When you give an offering to the Lord, it talks. And if you listen, God talks back. God came to Solomon and said, what do you want? And Solomon said, listen, God, I need wisdom. I need discernment. I need the ability to rule this great people of yours. And it says that because he asked the Lord for wisdom and discernment and not for riches, not for the life of his enemy, not for all these carnal things, he says that the Lord gave him what he asked for and gave him all the rest beside. See, when we give an offering to the Lord, it talks. Our tithe speaks to the heavens. Our tithe speaks of covenant. Our offering, our seed that we sow, seeds are programmed to germinate. Seeds are programmed to reproduce. Why do we encourage you about this? Because this is not a religious duty. This is part of breakthrough. You need a breakthrough, sow a seed. You need a breakthrough, make sure your tithes are paid. You need a breakthrough, make sure you're in right covenant with God. These are spiritual principles. And so we're going to pray today. I want you to stand. We're going to pray over your offering. Father, we thank you, Lord, that as Abraham brought his offering, God, you came down and you released an impartation to him, God, that caused breakthrough into his entire, into his entire rulership, Father God. Instantaneously, God, you visited him and you released what he needed. So, Father, we thank you, God, in this atmosphere of breakthrough today, God, as we put seed in the ground, Father. Lord, as we begin to offer that, our sacrifice up on an altar before you, God, that you're coming down, you're listening to what our money is saying, God, as we say, God, we're going to serve you above everything else. God, we're going to honor you above everything else. God, we're not just going to sing songs with our mouth, but Father God, we're going to honor you <laughs> with, our, with our substance, God. We bless you for that in Jesus' name. God bless you this morning as you come and bring your offering to the Lord. Well, thank you so much, Father. We bless this time of giving. We bless every seed, every tithe, every offering, Father God. And Lord, we declare that it causes heavens to be open, causes the devourer to be rebuked, God, and causes a blessing to flow in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, we've got something very special we want to do before we dismiss the children. You know, it says to give honor to whom honor is due. This year has been a special year for Walton County. Uh, we had... Uh, Superintendent Russell Hughes be named out of all of the counties of Florida, the superintendent of the year. Give the Lord a hand clap for that. But this last week, we got another honor right here out of this house. And so we're going to put a picture up or a video. I don't know which we got first. Do we have the video? 
All right, let's show this video. We can, I don't know if we can turn the sound up a little bit. Good morning. Dan Marcinkowski has been a volunteer of the Walton County Sheriff's Office since November 2014. Initially as a member of the Crisis Negotiation Unit, Dan has assisted in organizing training for the unit, team building, planning events for births, of babies, retirements, and his infamous prime rib dinners on Christmas <laughs> to help bring the team together. He has been the glue of our team that has gone through several changes over the years, and I couldn't be more grateful to his guidance. Most recently, Dan serves as a peer support professional for our agency and also as a chaplain. He has woken up in the middle of the night and responded to numerous calls for service and has even provided services to other agencies when their chaplain was not available. Specifically, on September 28, 2023, Dan responded to a possible suicidal subject with a brand new crisis negotiation unit. It's, it's tough. <laughs> and he was able to su successfully communicate with the individual and was eventually able to guide them to mental health services. Dan's willingness to serve ultimately resulted in a safe resolution for the evening, not only for the negotiators, but the deputies involved. Dan also always informs our teams when he's going to be out of town. He wants to ensure that there is always coverage. He asks for nothing in return and only desires to serve. He has been a strong support system for families during the most traumatic times of their lives. He refers them to counseling, ser counseling services and will even invite them to church if they don't have a church family. His one desire is for the people of our agency and our community <coughs> is to feel loved and supported. He has been successful in that. For these reasons, I am privileged to present Dan Marcinkowski with the Volunteer of the Year Award. Dan, Volunteer of the Year for Walton County. That is our Sheriff, Sheriff Mike Atkinson, presenting this award to him. And he is our community liaison here in Walton County and for our surrounding community, as well as Okaloosa at times, and has served on the negotiation team for hostage situations, as uh, now is the chaplain of our uh, county sheriff's department. He has uh, been out on all kinds of calls. He's got his radio on all the time about uh, the things that are happening uh, through the sheriff's department. Uh, he goes on a lot of other kind of volunteer things in our community as well with our schools and with, of course, our children here locally, but uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce, he's been so involved for so many years. This is really a long time coming, but it's well, well deserved. Can we give a big, come on, Vision Church appreciation for our own Pastor Dan, Officer Dan, whatever we wanna say, amen. have something to say. Let me turn off this. It, my wife made me get hearing aids and the phone is playing in my ears. <laughs> I don't know why she made me get hearing aids, but she did. <laughs> I know this. One person can't make an organization successful. It takes teamwork. It takes strong teamwork. What makes us, this church, successful isn't one person. It's not one pastor, one deacon, one elder, one anything. It's the teamwork of all of us, all of us, that makes this church successful. Successful for what? Successful for the kingdom of God. Amen. So it's us working together. Oh, it's nice to get a plaque and have your name on it. But that plaque represents every single one of you that's sitting out there. I couldn't do and wouldn't do what, I, what I'm able to do without knowing that I have the spiritual support and backing of my church. So this plaque belongs to you as much as it belongs to me, and I thank you for the opportunity to serve you guys. Amen. Oh! Let's get another picture here. Amen. 
awesome. We are so proud of Pastor. And I can remember the, the day he drove over, he said, hey, uh, I heard you're a pastor in a church over there. We're from Louisiana. Can we go over and have lunch with you? And we met over here, I think, at Applebee's or something, and we had lunch. <clears throat> and uh, he had been working in emergency management. He'd been in the military. He had, uh, was <clears throat> currently in a very high position over there of helping people out and had a nice home. And uh, they said, we want to move over here. We feel a call to the next generation. And we said, we got no place. We got no money. I mean, uh, we can't. Well, we said, well, look, I'll just come and serve. You know what this man did? He worked driving trams down here at Sandestin to the beach and around with all the wonderful, wonderful tourists. He flipped burgers at Burger King, I think it was, and worked at maybe Hardy. Hardy, Hardy sorry about that. And um, I don't know if we're going up or down when we do that. But anyhow, uh, and uh, I think he may have even worked at Tom Thumb, I'm not sure. But he just did what he had to, and he became our youth pastor, took kids on trips around the world, and ministered so powerfully out of his heart. But I do remember what he said to me that day at lunch. He said, well, pastor, you know, there's 24 hours in, in a day, and that's a lot of time. And that's about the way he's lived his life. One more hand for Pastor Dan. Amen. Let me just say also, we had our online Word of the Lord conference for 2024. Whoa. And it was so successful. We had so much uh, uh, people coming and joining and registering. I hope that you did too and got the download of all the different ones. We had, uh, who all did we have? We had uh, Enos Chamberlain did an amazing job actually. And uh, Jennifer LeClaire, Rabbi Kurt Landry, uh, Chuck Pierce, Tommy Ariami, Patricia King. Thank you, honey, you're helping me out. There's a few others, Bishop and myself and um, Pastor Jane, of course, ministering as well and some others. It was just so, so great. I think uh, Apostle Sharon did the, the deliverance time. Some of you are on prophetic teams. Our technical team behind the scenes was amazing. Give them all a hand of appreciation. They worked really, really, really hard and uh, it was a very big success. I want to let you know several things that are coming up very quickly. Um, we have um, a prison ministry meeting. Rich Hart, if you'll stand up, we have a prison ministry meeting immediately following the service today. If you're interested in participating, you can go to the Elisha room immediately following the service or see Rich Hart. Um, tremendous, tremendous ministry. Give him a wonderful hand. Amen. Um, also, Pastors Edgar and Victoria, if you guys would stand up, they have are sent from this house. They're planting a church down in the Sarasota area and doing great this morning. He's one that gave that powerful prophetic word. Give them a wonderful hand. Kristen Kellett. Kristen, if you'll stand up. Kristen is this next Saturday conducting an online training for people that have had trauma uh, uh, from sexual abuse. And you can see there, it's an online training from 10 o'clock in the morning until noon. It's called SCARS. So if you want more information on that, you can see her or I think that there may be some flyers. Uh, Ann Abair, where are you? Ann is here next Saturday. Saturday night, there is a healing and miracle encounter right here in the Elisha room at six o'clock, uh, six o'clock to eight o'clock. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, so we, you don't want to miss it. It's a powerful, powerful time. So come out and be a part with that. Um, also, we, uh, Pastors Joe and Anna, if, if you guys will stand, and Pastor Anna's right here. Next Saturday as well. Yes, next Saturday as well. We are starting our next semester of School of the Prophets, all right? So you're not going to want to miss this. A powerful 90-day online school um, that's going to kick it up to another level. Um, and so it's all online. So those of you that are watching online, you're going to want to participate, uh, you can go to schooltheprophets.us or you can text the word prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, to 55444. You can use that QR code right there to find out more information. We invite you to join us. It's going to be for three months and it's going to be a powerful, powerful time. Also, Pastor Anna, that was just standing, if you could stand again, um, she's getting ready to launch our next Vision Culture class. So if you're not a member here at Vision Church and you'd like to become a member, you'd like to learn more about about our culture here. Uh, we want to invite you to come out. Um, it's three Sundays in February, the 4th, the 11th, and the 18th. And uh, we're going to take you through a class after church. We'll feed you lunch and uh, at the end be able to lay hands on you and welcome you into our church family. You can see Pastor Anna or you can call the church about that. Um, also, Anthony Smoots, if you'll stand up. Um, Anthony is 
getting ready to do something really fun. If you're over 50 years old, 50 or over, I want you to stand. No, no, no lying spirits. Okay, 50 and over. All right, look around the room. I love the spirit of honesty here. Okay, 50 and over on um, February the 10th. Um, Anthony Smoots is leading a Valentine's dinner. Now, you don't even have to have a Valentine. You can come as a single individual as well. But there's going to be a Valentine's dinner right here at the church. It's a Saturday evening. For the mature. mature, That's right. Um, And so, um, is there going to be a sign-up sheet in the back, Anthony? Okay, so immediately following this service, please go back and sign up for this amazing time of fellowship and just camaraderie. Um, You can scan the QR code and you can find out more about that um, online. So get your phones out. I'm going to teach the 50 and overs how to scan a QR code. Take your phone out, open up the camera, and zero it in on that little black and white square. Until it gets a little thing, and then you're going to click on that. Some of you are going to be so proud of yourselves today. You're going to, they're going to say, what did you get from church today? I learned how to scan a QR code. God's taking us higher in a lot of ways, all right? Valentine, Valentine that's right, Valentine's at 6 p.m. Saturday evening for 50 and over. God bless you all. You can be seated, and I, we will look forward to seeing you there. God bless the kids as they go to children's ministry in Jesus' name. Amen. Give Apostle Jane a hand. We love her. And she's getting ready to minister for us. But I just wanted to say a couple of things first. One, I I do appreciate all the comfort and care and love that people have expressed to me about my grief about the Dallas Cowboys last week. So I want to talk any more about it, really. Ashes are off my head. The sackcloth is gone. I'm just in, 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 you know, I sing that song, Good God Almighty, no matter what happens, I'm going to praise the Lord. So anyhow, uh, (laughs) we do want to do something. My wife uh, is going to be ministering on angel armies this morning. God just said, this is what we need to decree. And so, uh, Robert, uh, would you go and stand on the other side of Bishop and Heath there? And uh, you're going to be his, Robert, come on up. Robert, I want uh, Aaron and her here. (laughs) We're going to have one on each side. And you uphold Bishop's hands, and he's going to, Dad, just stretch your hands out toward the congregation. You hold them up by the elbow there. Can you do that? There you go. Aaron and her. I'm sorry. I had the picture of Aaron and her and Moses, right? Okay. And he's stretching his hands out towards you. I want you to lift up your hands. And I remember when Cindy Jacobs made a decree over Bishop and said, Bishop, God says you are a five-star general. Now, this is the key about a five-star general. There are only five-star generals during times of war. And so uh, in times of war, we commission five-star generals to take their place. And I think uh, maybe, I don't know what all my wife is going to say, but I do know that Bishop had a divine encounter with the Lord and the angel Michael, who is a warring angel. And there was an introduction that took place. And he said, uh, the Lord said to him, uh, Bishop Hammond, uh, this is Michael, my general in the army of the Lord of the angels in heaven. And he said, Michael, this is Bishop Hammond, one of the generals of my army of the church in the earth. And there was a divine introduction and divine connection. So, Father, as Bishop stretches his hands out toward us, we just receive the commissionings of heaven. We receive that download and that upgrade. We're ascending at the right hand. We're ascending up into that place of the heavenlies with you. We're taking our rightful place in the army, the rightful place with authority. And Father, we just receive that blessing and that commissioning that's coming from Bishop now. And we thank you for having one like this amongst us that we can honor, but also can receive from. And we're here, Lord, to give you, the Lord of hosts, all the glory. Give a shout to the king and a welcome to Apostle Jane. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Amen. Well, um, right after that happened, that Bishop had this commissioning um, that actually came through this prophetic word with Mahesh Shavda that happened over over 20 years ago. We were at a conference here. um, I think it was an October conference, which is usually our, our largest conference. 
And Bishop was up on the platform preaching. And all of a sudden, as he was preaching, now he, he was over 20 years younger then, okay, so he was, you know, still almost 70, but very, very sharp, very, very fast in his preaching. But it seemed like all of a sudden during his preaching, he got very confused. He started shuffling papers. He got confused. He stopped talking, which I don't know if I've ever heard Bishop stop talking. Yeah, he's been, yeah, he's been, he always says, I've been knocked out three times and I never stopped talking the whole time. So, um, but he, he just was very frustrated. And I asked the Lord, I was sitting on the front, on the front row and I said, Lord, show me what's happening in the spirit. How many understand there's two realms? There's the seen realm and there's the unseen realm. And so I asked the Lord, show me what's happening in the spirit. And, and I saw a vision. And you know, sometimes we have not because we ask not. Okay? Something's going wrong in your life and we just take it at face value. We take it in the natural realm. But that night I knew there, there was something else at work. And so I said, Lord, show me what's happening. And I saw a demonic figure kind of, kind of over this over this part of the building outside and it was blowing this black trumpet. And when it did, it was like there was this convergence of the hosts of hell. I mean, it looked like a movie, but I mean, it was like this convergence of the hosts of hell that he was, that he was battling through while he was standing up here. And we used to have a prayer room right over here and I zipped off the front row and I went back there and I said, this is what I just saw. This is what's happening to Bishop. They said, we, we just had that exact same vision. We saw the exact same thing. We were in here, they were in there, they saw the exact same thing. So they began to pray. I came right back out into the service and we began to make decrees. And as we did that, all of a sudden, it was again like a scene from a movie. I saw Michael come down, blowing this, this golden trumpet. And when he came down like that, the demons just went. And, and right when I saw that happen, Bishop went, huh. I wonder what that was. And then just kept on preaching. You understand, guys, that, that there's an unseen realm around us. And so this is a part of the teaching that I do when I teach on discernment. But I really felt stirred to preach on it on a Sunday morning. It's a little bit of an unusual topic for a Sunday morning. But if you'll go to that next screen, I'm going to give you why I'm going to share this on the Sunday morning. Because number one, the word angel appears 289 times in the scripture. And angelic appearances are all the way from Genesis through Revelation. It is extremely filled. The Bible is extremely packed with stories of angelic encounters. The first one happens in Genesis chapter 16 when Abraham, remember, um, Sarah couldn't get pregnant and so she gave Abraham her servant, Hagar, and Hagar got pregnant and had the first baby for Abraham and his name was Ishmael and Sarah wanted Hagar and Ishmael put outside the camp. And the Lord sent an angel down and the angel brought promises to Hagar who was the mother of Ishmael, and Ishmael, we know, was the father of pretty much all the stuff that's going on in the, in the Middle East and the Islamic nations and the, and the Middle Eastern, Northern Africa nations is Ishmael. So just when I was restudying angels for this message, I felt like the Lord said, you know what, that's a promise to people that are outside of covenant right now. That means your unsafe family member. That means your, your, uh, your boss that's not saved. That means that the friend that you've been witnessing to. Come on, God wants to send angels down to encounter the lost in this season of time. And actually, when you start hearing testimonies that are coming out of the Middle East, angels are appearing. Physical angels are appearing to people and saying, if you'll go over and stand on this street corner, Somebody will be there to talk to you and they'll lead them to Christ. It's the craziest stuff. We hear so many stories right now about God going after Ishmael through angelic encounters. We see um, 
angels showing up as humans all the way through Genesis. We see that angels dealt with Lot. We see that angels dealt with Abraham. Uh, we see um, Elijah and Elisha both saw angels. Um, we see that um, Jacob saw angels. The, the, the story of Jacob's ladder, the angels in ascending and descending, and Jacob saying, this is none other than the gate of heaven. Um, Zechariah saw angels. And so really, uh, and then all the way through the book of Acts and all the way in the, in the New Testament, we find that there are angels. But when was the last time that you heard a message on angels? So one of the reasons that, uh, so I wanted to challenge us, number three, is that we've got to be aware of the unseen realm. We are humans. We are intellectuals. A lot of times we only trust the things that our five senses can connect with. But we have to understand that there is a realm around us that is the spirit realm that we cannot see with our natural eye, but if we learn to tune our ear and tune our eye, we can actually see in the unseen realm. And of course, the best picture of this is Second uh, Kings chapter six, when Elisha is um, the prophet in the land at the time, and, and uh, the Syrian army is making war against Judah, and um, the Syrian kings keeps laying these ambushes for the, the for the, the God's people, and God would show Elisha, this is what the the enemy kings are setting as a trap. How many think that there's some enemy kings setting traps today? He said, this is what some of the enemy kings are setting as a trap. So don't fall into the trap. Go a different way. <laughs> so the Syrian king says, oh, we must have a spy in our camp because every time we set a trap. The, the, the Jewish people don't fall into it. We've got a spy. And somebody said to him, no, king, it's not a spy. It's that prophet Elisha who keeps seeing into our plans and exposing them. And so the Syrian king said, well, would somebody go kill him? Okay. So he was hanging out at that time in a city called Dothan. I don't think it was Dothan, Alabama. Okay. But it was a city called Dothan. And, and he and his servant were asleep one night, and the enemy armies came and surrounded them. Most of us know this story, surrounded them. And in the morning, Elisha's servant got up, opened up the window, looked outside, and saw all these chariots and horsemen and soldiers of the Syrian army that was surrounding them. And Elisha's servant ran to Elijah, Elisha and said, oh my God, what are we going to do? And Elisha went over to the window, looked out and went, yeah, don't worry. There are more with us than are with them. I believe that we're living in that day where we've got to understand there are more with us than are with them. We're living in a season of time right now that we better pray that God opens our spiritual eyes. Otherwise, we're going to be freaking out, full of fear, and whatever is not of faith is sin. <laughs> okay? He said... There are more that are with us than are with them. His servant went back and was like, um, I, I see like hundreds of them and only two of us. And Elisha prayed this prayer. And I'm going to pray it for you today. Just lay your hands on your eyes. He said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And immediately, Elisha's servant's eyes were opened. And he saw the angel armies. You can take your hands off your eyes. Sometimes and when I don't tell you to take your hands off your eyes, you spend the rest of the service with your hands on your eyes, okay? So, what's interesting is that here's where, here's where we're living right now, is we've got to understand that there is a truth and a natural reality to this realm. How many understand they really were surrounded by the enemy. In the natural realm, they were surrounded by the enemy. But what we've got to learn to do is look past the natural into the supernatural. We've got to look past the natural truth into the supernatural truth. And in the supernatural realm, there are more that are with us than are with them. We have a, a dear friend. She's one of the board of governors for Christian International. She's a medical doctor. So if you want to talk about people being very intellectual um, and yet very spiritual, because some people go, oh, angels, you know, I'm, I'm smarter than that. 
Let me just tell you, you're not smarter than angels. Okay? Angels will blow your mind. So, she's a medical doctor, but she and her husband travel around to different churches and do ministry and stuff. And when her son was little, he would always go with them. And when he was about six, seven, eight years old, he saw angels like you and I see people. And so they'd come into these churches and she would always ask them, Koa, what are the angels saying? What are the angels doing? And she was always amazed at his response and how the angels were responding to what was taking place in the church. And at, at times that they were down front dancing and celebrating, he'd say, oh, ma'am, the angels are jumping around. They're twirling. They're dancing. They're dancing in between the people. They're dancing up in the air. They're dancing. They're celebrating. One time they were doing some intense spiritual warfare prayer. She said, Koa, what are the angels doing? He goes, oh, mom, it's so cool. The angels, like, they have these swords and they're spinning these swords. And, and lightning and sparks are flying out. And then they were in this one church that was kind of dead. Sorry. Just not a lot of life in the church. And she said, Koa, what are the angels doing? And he goes... Oh, they're hanging out back in the foyer talking. Listen, if angels are coming here, I hope they're not hanging out in the foyer talking. I hope that angels who are ministering spirits are in here doing what God needs to do because there's a partnership between heaven and earth. There's angel armies, there's earthly armies, and God is bringing a partnership between us that we need to understand. We need to understand this. I'm also talking about it on a Sunday morning because I believe we're living in a time of increased angelic activity. We were talking with Marty Layton, Pastor Marty Layton, a dear friend of ours, um, and uh, he pastors in Nashville, and we were just talking to him a couple days ago, and he had a, this experience this week. He said he woke up in the middle of the night, and there was a very large man standing in his bedroom, kind of freaked him out at first. You know, people say, oh, I saw this angel. No, you wake up and there's a large man in your bedroom. How many know your liver will quiver, okay? It, it's liable to scare you half to death. That's how, why most of the time angels will go, fear not, okay? I think I'd still be fearing, okay? But the angel was standing in his bedroom and told, him, and told Marty, said, I'm an angel of recovery. And he's going through some battles right now, but God's promise is that there's angels of recovery being released, Amen. This is what Apostle Tom said last week when he was talking about the Shunammite. And he talked about how the Shunammite went before the king to make an appeal for her house and her land. How many of y'all remember that? Okay, because it was just last week. Y'all should remember that, okay? Second Kings chapter, if you don't remember it, all right? But when she went to make an appeal for her house and her land, it says that the king appointed a certain officer for her to go with her to get back her land, get back her house, and to take back all the proceeds of the field for the last seven years that should have been hers. Come on, God said, restore all. The king said, restore all. I believe that there are angels of recovery being released in this season of time, that whatever the enemy has stolen from you, whatever has been lost in battles, whatever has been lost because of uh, relational fallouts or, or situations that you didn't count, come on, there are angels of recovery that God is releasing to us in this season of time. And some of y'all need to lift your hands and, and partner with that right now, because there's an unseen realm that God is dispatching angels and they are being sent to prepare the way. In Genesis a chapter something, I'll put it on the screen later, it says, I think Genesis 24, it says that God sent an angel before them to prosper their way. My husband's going to agree. We need, we need some divine recovery, all right? Amen. So we're living in this time that we've got to be sensitive to what's happening. We've also got to understand that this is the year of Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. That's referenced 282 times in the Bible. And number six, we need to understand supernatural things without being weird or strange. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't be weird. Because I know talking about angels can seem weird. I know that a lot of you are, are like, you know, can we just talk about Jesus? But we're ta also talking about a guy that, was, that came back from the dead, okay? So, 
let's just say that the supernatural things are beyond natural. If you don't mind standing to your feet, I want to declare Psalms 24 over you. Lift your hands up. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of the angel armies. He is the King of glory. Give him a shout of praise in this place today. Hallelujah. You can be seated. The Lord of hosts in Scripture is the, is the phrase Jehovah Sabaoth. Sabaoth comes from the Hebrew word Saba. Sabaoth is the plural of this. Saba means a mass of people organized for war. Think about this. This is how God has elected to define himself more than any of his other names. Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Shama, Jehovah, uh, Jehovah Jireh. Uh, all of these amazing names of God give us the nature and character of God that we can draw on. But this is the one that he's used the most, 284 times. A mass of people organized for war, soldiers, company, army, an army, a force, the Lord of the angel army, the Lord of the forces. We see in the Amplified, it says, who is he then, this king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory who rules over creation with all his heavenly armies. In the message translation, it says, who is this King Glory? God of the angel armies, he is King Glory. And in the Passion translation, y'all want to stand up again? Y'all going to think you're back in the Catholic Church. Stand up again, okay? Stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down. Listen to how it says it in the Passion. So, because listen, we're not talking about some inanimate gateways. Some inanimate, we are talking about us. We are the living gates. So lift your hands up. So wake up, you living gateways. Lift up your heads, your heads, you doors of eternity. Welcome the King of glory, for he's about to come through you. You ask, who is the King of glory? Glory, Yahweh, armed and ready for battle. Yahweh, invincible in every way. So wake up, you living gateways, and rejoice. Fling wide, you eternal doors. Here he comes. The King of glory is ready to come in. You ask, who is this King of glory? He is Yahweh, armed and ready for battle, the mighty one, the invincible commander of the heaven's hosts. Yes, he is the King of glory. Shout to him again this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, now you can be seated. Now, Throughout all these times in Scripture that it talks about angels and angelic appearances, sometimes those angelic appearances are appearances of the pre-incarnate Christ. Okay, he's referred to as an angel. But for example, um, in Joshua chapter 5, when we find Joshua and the children of Israel getting ready to cross over and begin to confront Jericho, the angel of the Lord appears to Joshua and begins to identify himself as the commander of the armies, of the Lord's armies. And so we understand that that in all likelihood is Jesus who is the commander, who is the captain of the Lord of hosts. We also see throughout scripture that God identifies himself as a man of war. Exodus chapter 14, um, they're getting ready to uh, cross over the Red Sea. Pharaoh's armies are rolling down on them. Uh, they don't really see any way out. They need something supernatural to happen. And in the midst of that, it's, the Lord shows up and he says, they say, the Lord will fight for you and you will hold your peace. You know, hold your peace means shut up. Sorry, we don't say shut up in our house, okay? 
but shut up, okay? Sometimes we just got to say, God's going to fight for us. Exodus chapter 15, when they're singing the glory, they're singing the victory, Miriam begins to sing, and she begins to declare, the Lord is a man of war. Now, how many of y'all were around back in the charismatic movement when we used to sing that song? I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and the rider thrown into the sea. How many of y'all remember that one? I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and the rider thrown into the sea. Do y'all know what that song's about? God killing their enemies. Now, I'm sorry if you've got God as this sweet little... Bishop likes to say Santa Claus. Okay. But our God is a man of war. And the name that he uses most to define himself is the captain of the armies. I don't know about you, but in wartime, and guess what? We are in wartime right now. There's a spiritual battle that is being waged. I believe in, I believe in the, the Western nations, the battle is between the woke and the awakened. Okay, and a global agenda that is trying to drive us into a world takeover. In, in other parts of the world, it is the, the antichrist against the Christ. Okay, there is a global war that's taking place right now, and there are natural wars that are springing up as a result of that. And I just believe that in a wartime, we need a war God. I don't know about you, but I want God fighting for my children. I want God fighting for my grandchildren. I want my God fighting for you that we pray for all the time. Come on. Sometimes there is no natural solution. What we need is a mighty man of war to rise up and part a Red Sea. Come on. Sometimes what we need is a mighty man of war. Like when the city of Jerusalem was besieged in Hezekiah's time, God sent one angel down and wiped out 185 uh, Assyrians overnight because they believed the word of the Lord. Come on, when you're in a war season, you, you don't just need a lamb of God. You need a lion of the tribe of Judah. And I'm not trying to say God's not the lamb, but I'm telling you, he's not just the lamb. He's the lion. So we have to understand the season that we're in. And we need to understand how to work with angel armies. Listen, I am not the expert on this subject. If you... <laughs> If you want to really, really dig into this, Tim Sheets, Dutch Sheets, brother Tim Sheets, you need to read him. He's written, I think, three books on this. He sees angels all the time. He encounters angels all the time. I see angels in the spirit. I don't see them like people. Although my, my, one of my first angelic encounters that I remember was I was up in the state of Michigan getting ready to, to preach a conference that, that day. And most of you have heard this, but, I've, but I, my alarm went off in the morning and uh, I confess that I am one of those people that believes the last 10 minutes in bed are the most comfortable 10 minutes in bed. Now, be honest, how many of y'all just immediately you jump up and you're, you're up and you're, you're going? You're early mornings or you're, you just jump up and you're at it? Okay, because there's some of you. How many of you like the snooze button? There are more that are with us than are with them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but seriously, I, I was in, I was, I had to hit my, my snooze button and I like to use that time to really immediately stop before I jump out of bed and think about what was I dreaming. Okay, take time, immediately think what you're dreaming. And I was rehearsing a dream. I was snuggled into my hotel room all by myself. I was in the bed. I kind of was laying on my side. I had the covers pu pulled up over my shoulder. And I was thinking about this dream that I had just had and kind of asking the Lord for the interpretation. But I was snuggling. Okay. I don't know which was the stronger urge, okay, to snuggle or to discern a dream, okay. But I was discerning a dream. All of a sudden, I felt a physical hand on my shoulder and it shook me and it shook my whole body. And when that happened, I heard a loud voice say, wake up. I sat up in bed. My heart was pounding. I looked around. I didn't see anything there. And I knew God had sent an angel down 
to shake me. And I, I said to the Lord, wow, Lord, I thought I was awake. I mean, if it's important enough for God to send an angel down to say, wake up. I, I knew that this was more than just get out of bed. I knew it was spiritual awakening. Wake up. And I said, Lord, I thought I was awake. He said, that's the problem. Most of my church thinks that they're awake, but they're still asleep. He said, you need to wake up so that you can wake them up. So wake up. <laughs> Come on, how many are willing to let God stretch you this year? God stretch you in your understanding of spiritual things. Listen to Hebrews chapter one, verse 14. Speaking of angels, it says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? How many here plan on inheriting salvation? Okay. If you didn't raise your hand right then, then you must have raised your hand in that first invitation. One translation says they're sent to help those who are to inherit salvation. If you're to inherit salvation, God wants to send angels to help us. And God has sent angels to help you, whether you know it or not. Now listen, we all know bad things have happened. We're grieving the loss of, uh, of, of one of the friends of the Catalanos, um, little Stevie, 19-year-old young man that died on a motorcycle. I don't have all the answers. But I can tell you that God knows the end from the beginning. But God's standard is that he wants to send angels to help us. The Amplified says, are not all angels ministering spirits sent out by God to serve a company and protect those who will inherit salvation. And in the Amplified, it ends by saying, of course they are. Okay, kind of like y'all should know this about angels. But how many understand we don't always know about angels? So we find that Jesus, in the very beginning of his ministry, he actually refers to angels when he's talking to um, uh, when he's talking to his, some of his disciples, and he said to them in John chapter 1, verse 50, he said, most assuredly I say to you, hereafter you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And so he was referring back to this ladder that's on your screen that is the picture that, uh, that Jacob had uh, Jacob's ladder, where he was getting ready to meet his brother Esau that he'd stolen the birthright from 20 years before. So he's a little nervous about this encounter. And God gives him this dream where he sees this ladder going up into heaven, angels ascending and descending. And when he wakes up from that, he says, this is Bethel. This is the house of bread, the house of God. And it is the gate of heaven. And so that's, that's what this is a picture of. Interestingly enough, years ago, um, Eddie James. How many of y'all know Eddie James? He's going to be here in March. Are we excited about that? Going to be good. But he, when he first started coming around the prophetic, he didn't really know that much about it. But he was just like weeping for a week because he had seen a vision right over here of a, of a ladder suddenly appearing and going up into heaven and angels ascending and ascending on the ladder. Come on, how many understand that those are heavenly portals that God is showing us, that there are portals, there are places where heaven ascends and it descends. But that can be in every single one of our houses. Come on, you can have an open heaven over your house. And so Jesus actually makes reference to this. We understand that, um, that in the New Testament, we see that there were angels in dreams surrounding the birth of Christ. We see that in Luke chapter 1 and 2, we see that the angel appeared to Zach, uh, Zacharias and told him that his barren wife, Elizabeth, was going to have a child. We see that the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her that she was going to have a child. In Matthew chapter 1 and 2, we know that the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream after Mary said, yep, um, I know that we're just engaged, but I have some news. I am pregnant by something called the Holy Ghost. And so it says that because he was an honorable man, he wanted to quietly end their betrothal. But that night, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, don't be afraid to take Mary for your wife because that which is conceived in her is conceived of the Holy Spirit. God, God may send an angel down into your dream. He may send an angel down into your life. He may send an angel uh, to, to protect things. Come on, we need to understand that angels are a part of the scripture. 
Cornelius was a Roman centurion, a Gentile. And all the way up to Acts chapter 10, all the way to Acts chapter 10, there's not one record of one Gentile being saved. How many here are 100% Jewish? Then guess what? We're Gentiles. <laughs> okay? We're Gentiles. How many are glad that God made the gospel available to Gentiles? Amen? But here we are all the way to Acts chapter 10, and this, this Roman centurion's crying out, what must I do to be saved? And an angel comes down to him and gives him a vision and says, send for Peter. Peter will tell you what to do. An angel sent him. And angels don't preach the gospel. They're not here to preach the gospel. But they will help set up the ability for people that need to connect to the gospel to connect. Think of your loved one. Think of your prodigal. Think of that one that you've been praying for. God has abilities to send angels to set them up so they can hear the gospel. So he sent for Peter, like the angel said, but the problem was Peter was a good Jewish boy and Jews and Gentiles don't mix. So Peter, God gave Peter these, the sheet lowered from heaven vision, right? Don't call unclean that which is called clean. And eventually Peter got the message. He came and he preached the gospel to Cornelius and Cornelius and his entire household were saved. The, 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 mission, the ministry to the Gentiles started because God gave a dream and an angelic visitation. This is important, guys. This is important. Peter was set free from prison by an angel. Paul was directed and guided by an angel in his missionary journeys. John was brought revelation by an angel. So, uh, so we have to understand that this is an important subject in the scripture, but so oftentimes we just skip right over it because it's supernatural. How many here have, in now in this church, I get it, okay, but how many here feel like you've seen an angel? Okay. How many of you feel like you have seen an angel with your physical eyes? Okay, a lot of people in this church. How many of you feel like you've seen angels with your, just the eye of your spirit? How many have had an encounter where you knew it was an angel, but you didn't see anything? Okay. Or maybe you interacted with a human that was probably an angel. Okay. Okay. My husband calls me his angel, but it's a different thing, okay? So, in Scripture, there are some warnings about angels, and we'll talk a little bit more about those just at the very end. But 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen says, Satan himself can be transformed as an angel of light. Galatians 1, 8 says, If I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which has been preached, let him be cursed. You know what? You know why I'm teaching on this? Because this has already happened. Supposed angels have created world religions. Has anybody here heard of the religion of Islam? Do you know that that religion started because a man named Muhammad had a supposed angelic visitation from Gabriel? Why do I say supposed and use air quotes? Because that wasn't Gabriel. He came, he, he, this angel, this demon came to him and created all these prophecies. The whole book of Quran is the revelation that came from that angel. False angel. If I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which has been preached, let him be cursed. Has anybody heard, here heard of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Mormonism. Do you realize that that entire religion started because supposedly a man named Joseph Smith had a visitation from a false angel named Moroni? Why do I know it was a false angel? Because he preached another gospel. How do I know that? Here's the clue. The Book of Mormon is called another gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to understand that I don't care how supernatural your experience is. I don't care if an angel with a flaming sword stands in front of you and you see him with your natural eyes. If his message contradicts the Genesis to Revelation word of God, that is a false manifestation. Amen. 
And I think we're coming into a day when there's going to be a lot of an increase in not just true angelic activity, but false as well. Psalms 103 verse 20 says, praise the Lord, you angels of his, you powerful warriors who carry out his decrees and obey his orders. Praise the Lord, all you warriors of his, you servants of his who carry out his desires. Now, look at some of the activity of angels. It says in Psalms 104 verse 4, who makes his angels spirits, his ministers flames of fire. So we see that, actually, we see angels manifest like, like fire. Because here in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, it says the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in the flame of fire in the burning bush. So is it possible, is it possible that the flames of fire on the day of Pentecost could have been the presence of angels? It was obviously the presence of the Holy Ghost, but wherever you find the Holy Ghost, you're probably going to find angels. Okay, let me just read you just a quick list of some of the things that angels do. They protect and deliver. They lead sinners to gospel workers. They appear in dreams. They give messages and interpretations. They direct us to those who need understanding concerning Christ. They bring answer to prayer. They worship around the throne of God continuously. They execute judgment on the earth. They engage in combat to free God's people and protect God's purposes. They go before us to prepare our way. They help prophetic promises come to pass. They bring enlightenment and revelation. They give messages. They strengthen us. They awaken us to the purposes of God. They gather. Uh, They uh, tend to the destiny of of our eternal purpose. They help apostles shift regions into God's purpose. They organize around offerings and assist in releasing blessings. They assist the church and Christ's heirs to advance God's kingdom. And they carry the breaker anointing. How many heard the prophetic word about the breaker anointing? They carry that, okay? So just real quickly, we're going to look at some of the types of angels. Are y'all getting something out of this? I think this is going to help us in the days ahead. So number one, we have the messenger angels. The most common one with that is Gabriel. Um, We know that Gabriel showed up in the New Testament and gave the news to Mary that she was going to conceive and have Uh, and bear God's son. But we also see that same Gabriel in Daniel chapter 10. And Gabriel comes down a couple different times in the book of Daniel. I love Daniel chapter one. It says Daniel had this dream that he didn't understand. And God said for Gabriel to go down and explain the meaning of the dream. So Gabriel came down and interpreted Daniel's dream. I've never had an angel interpret my dream. I feel a little ripped off at this moment, okay? Okay. But this is what they do, okay? And then when Daniel was in his fast in Daniel chapter 10, Gabriel came down and began to show us probably one of the most clear pictures of supernatural heavenly warfare because the second category up there is warrior angels. And uh, this is again Daniel chapter 10. And Gabriel says this, God heard your prayers and on the very first day that you prayed, I was sent because of your words. How many know that God hears your prayers? And God will mobilize angels because of your words. But Gabriel said, however, the prince of Persia, and I don't have time to get off on that, but that is part of the global conflict right now, is that an ancient spirit of the prince of Persia is contending in the spiritual atmosphere over nations, including this one. But he said, but the prince of Persia withstood me. He kept me from getting to you. He delayed. He hindered. So Michael, the archangel, the warrior angel, had to come and fight with him so I could come and deliver this message to you. What a picture of spiritual battle. What a picture of spiritual contending. That's why you may pray one day and you don't see the answer. Keep praying. Keep praying. Keep praying. Because the angels were sent because of his word. And there was an epic battle going on in the spirit realm between the prophetic messenger angel and Michael and this demonic spirit, the prince of Persia. So we need to understand that that is part of the nature of it. Number three, angel armies. Angel armies. We see God mobilizing armies of angels. And I'm going to, I'll actually come back to that one. No, I'm going to do this now. Um, So in 2015, 
My husband and I were traveling in Australia. We had just landed in Australia to minister at our bases in Australia and New Zealand at that time. And our first night on the ground, I had a dream with angels in it. And I saw four angels in the dream and they presented themselves to me as the four horsemen of awakening. And I won't go into the rest of the dream, but they were basically the angels that were being sent to bring awakening in the earth. And so when I woke up, I wrote down this phrase, four horsemen of awakening. And I started talking to my husband about the four horsemen. And of course, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Okay, their names were stuff like death and famine and what is that? plague. I mean, bad stuff. Okay. These were not those angels. Okay. Whew, okay. But they were called the, they called themselves the four horsemen of awakening. So, you know, we talked a, a little bit about this and my husband said that there was a football team. It was it Chicago? Oh, Notre Dame. Notre Dame's offensive line were called the four horsemen and they would break the way open. So I thought, okay, that's a great interpretation to that dream. But we get to service that night, and Apostle Greg Bailey is preaching that night. And he says, you know, he says, today's a very significant day in Australia and New Zealand. He says that today is uh, what they call Anzac Day, A-N-Z-A-C. He said the Anzac stands for Australia, New Zealand Army Corps. And he said these were the soldiers from Australia and New Zealand that fought and won on that day a tremendous battle in 1915 in World War I in a city called Gallipoli, which is like over where Turkey is, and they broke through the enemy's lines. Two years later, it was the same Anzacs that actually went into Beersheba, the southern part of Israel, and broke through against the, uh, against impossible odds against the Germans and the Ottoman Turks. And this is where my ears perked up. He said, and they were known as the light horsemen. And I was like, oh, horsemen, I hear this, okay? So have you ever heard Charge of the Light Horse Brigade? You ever heard that familiar old poem? Well, this is about the Anzacs. This is about their charge. So, so here's the interesting thing, and this is written in books, and it's very, very well known over in Australia and New Zealand. And it's the story of what happened when they took the battle of Beersheba. And this illustrates my angel army's point, okay? On that day, which happened to be October 31st, October 31st, 1917. What day is October 31st? What, el what other day is October 31st? Reformation Day. Okay, Reformation Day, the day that Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the door of the Wittenberg Church, okay? On Reformation Day, there were 800 Anzacs, Australian, New Zealand soldiers, under the direction of a British commander, who were commanded to charge against the enemy forces. There were 400, there were 4,400 soldiers on the other side. They had artillery, they had uh, far advanced weaponry. The Anzacs had their horse, their gun with a bayonet, and a Bible. And yet they were told to charge. One of the things that they say about the Anzacs is that they had incredible courage. So they charged against the impossible odds of the enemy line. And as they charge, about halfway across the battlefield, the bombs exploding everywhere, the artillery going off, people being shot. I think only about 70 of the Anzac fell that day, but about halfway across the battlefield, the enemy just stopped firing. And they charged in and they broke through the enemy's line against impossible odds. And when they did, the enemy, the Germans and the Ottoman Turks, put down their weapons and applauded them. They said, we've never seen such bravery. How many believe that God's looking for an army that's that brave? That's that obedient. That against impossible odds, we do what the Lord says and we see God break through. But here's the thing that makes this story so profound. 
There are thousands of military accounts on both sides of this battle that say when they got to the middle of that battlefield, suddenly light beings and light horsemen and light chariots began to appear on the field like they were fighting with these 800 Anzacs. You know what they were seeing? They were seeing angels. No wonder they stopped firing. Come on, they saw an angel army advancing across the field with them and they broke through. Two weeks later, those same Anzacs with the British troops marched up and overtook Jerusalem and liberated Jerusalem from 1,400 years of Islamic rule. They took back Jerusalem, amen? You know what the other name of the Battle of Beersheba is called? It's called the Battle of Gaza. Are we, are we there again? How many believe God wants to send angel armies down in the midst of conflicts, in the midst of battles, in the midst of, of battlefields, in the midst of your own battlefield? God wants to send angels down because remember, they're sent to assist those who are to inherit salvation. You've got angels of deliverance, angels of breakthrough, angels of protection, ministering angels. You've got angels of provision, Genesis 24, 40, where it says that God sent an angel before him to prepare the way. I want to read one, one last scripture to you that I want us to pray together. This is the story out of Acts chapter 12. In case you think that this kind of teaching has no place in today's world, I'm going to read you out of the very middle chapter of the book of Acts. It says, it was about that time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. Let me just say here, in America so far, we're not really arrested for being Christians. So far. But when you go over and you meet with the Chinese leaders, as we've done, we sat around a table, and you know what the conversation was? Every one of their conversations was how much time they'd spent in prison and how many arrest warrants were out against them. And it was kind of bragging rights. They were like, oh, yeah, I've got arrest warrants this big. And, oh, no, I've got arrest warrants this big. I mean, they were almost bragging for how much they've been pursued. Oh, I've been beaten. I've been tortured. I've been Guess what? They're glorying in it. It's not what the, the early apostles did. Crazy, right? So... Herod was arresting those that belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to the guard by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. I mean, they were treating him like he was some horrific, violent criminal. But guess what? You know why they were doing that? Because they understood there was supernatural power that was helping the church. The unbeliever saw the power of God and was afraid of it. Suddenly, everybody say suddenly. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up. If an angel does that, don't hit the snooze button. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains just fell off of Peter's wrists. And the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing, what was, if it was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and the second guards, and they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. We're talking about open doors. Guess what? Sometimes it's angels that open the doors for you. Sometimes you feel bound, you feel in captivity, you feel like there's no way out. I'm telling you that God will make a way, even if he has to send an angel down to make a way for you. God will send angels to protect you. 
My husband, uh, my husband and I went to Christ for the Nations. And when I was there, my very, I think it was my second year there, he was already back in Phoenix. I was, um, one of my friends from Arkansas had come down and we had gone to this park um, and we're sitting at a picnic table talking and catching up about everything that had gone on back in Arkansas. And while we're sitting there, the sun starts to set. Now, we didn't realize that this park was a notorious park for gangs. Okay? So it was actually very dangerous, but it just looked pretty. So we were there. And we're sitting at this picnic table, and we're, I'm kinda, we're sitting on the table with our feet on the, on the bench, and we're kind of sitting side by side, and we're just watching some different things that are happening. When from over here, all of a sudden, I see these two large burly kind of looking guys come walking at us. And one of them has a knife that the blade of the knife was about this long. And the other one is smacking a baseball bat at his, at his hand. And they're walking right at us with an angry look at their fa on their face. <laughs> Not good. And they're just, they're just right there. So I, I reach over to my friend to say to him, look at these guys that are coming we need to get out of here. But instead, what came out was, I was so mad, I couldn't just speak English to him, but tongues just started rolling out of me. He looked at me like I'd lost my mind. By now, these two gang members were standing right in front of us with this angry look on their face. And I'm going, I don't know if they thought I was crazy. But all of a sudden, they both got this look of sheer terror on their face. And they looked at each other and they ran as fast as they could go. You know what I think? I think there was an angel right behind me. We didn't see him, but they saw him. Either that or they just thought I was flat out crazy, okay? Do we have that screen that says safeties or cautions concerning angels? Just real quick. Angels are not to be worshipped, not to be sought after or revered more than God. We don't seek angels. We're not going to seek angel visitations. We're going to seek Holy Ghost visitations. Right? But they may happen. Angels are not ours to command. They listen for the word of God. But we can decree and we can ask God to send angels. Angels are on assignment not to be our friend or for entertainment. You don't hang out with angels. Me and my angel, you know, we were shopping the other day and I've heard people say crazy. That is not, no, okay? No. No doctrine should be built on messages from angels. And let me just say this, depiction of angels in the Bible are always human and male, and tough. Now, there are seraphim and cherubim around the throne of God. They, they look a little different. They're actually kind of weird. They've got eyes all over their head, okay? But, but when we see angels interacting with humans, they're always male. Here's, here's the thing. New Age introduced female depictions of angels. You may even go home and find some in your home. But biblical angels are always male and tough and they, half the time, most of the time, probably don't have wings. Okay? They look like people. And so, my husband and I were in a, in a train station in Prague. I'm just going to close with this and then we're going to activate. My husband and I were in a train station in Prague. We were trying to get to Vienna. And as much as it seemed like a great thing to do, we had no idea what we were doing. It was some of our first t travel over there. We didn't know how to, how to ride trains in Europe. It's a lot more complicated than you think it is, okay? And so um, we were trying to figure out the platform that our train would be leaving from. And we had, well, let me just say, we had American luggage. I'm not trying to lump all you in, but I always say that I pack like... Um, like Noah packed the ark, he took seven of everything that was clean and two of everything else, okay? So 
that's pretty much, uh, we, we pack heavy, okay? We had these two big duffel bags and we had these, we were traveling for about a month in Europe, two big duffel bags and we each had a carry-on. And so we each had a big carry-on, uh, a big duffel and a carry-on. And so we were trying to figure it out. Nobody spoke English. Um, and we were, we were trying to ask, you know, how do we, you know, find things and people just look at us and they didn't speak English. So Tom, Apostle Tom says, well, I'm going to run over here and I'm going to ask somebody, you just stay here with the luggage. And so, um, he, he was gone and all of a sudden this little bitty man, and he, he was pretty short. He comes up and he says, you go veen. I said, excuse me, um, pardon me. He says, you go veen. And I said, um, I, what? I, I don't understand. And he said, you go veen, you go first class. And we'd bought first class tickets on these train. And he had those in his pocket. And so there's no way that he could have even known this. And I was like, um, veen? He goes, Vienna. So in, in, uh, in, in Prague, the name for Vienna is veen, W-E-I-N. So I didn't know that. That's why we were looking for Vienna. It wasn't on the board. It was Veen. Okay, W-E-I-N. He goes, you go Veen, you go first class. Come. And he grabs two of our suitcases and takes off. And I'm like, wait. And so I grab the other two and I start running after him. And pretty soon he sees me. I'm like, Tom. And I'm chasing the guy that just took our luggage. And so he's like running up. And he goes, what are you doing? And I'm like, I just, uh, just follow this guy. He took our, su our suitcases. And the guy yells over his shoulder, you go Veen, you go first class. And he's just rolling away with our suitcase. He took the heaviest ones. That's good. And then he takes us up on this train platform. And my husband's like, how could you just let this guy take our stuff? And I'm like, well, I, you know, he just did it. It happened so fast. And so we're following him. And, we, and when you're standing on a, a train platform, there was all these people standing around to get on the train. Well, he walks right past all these people. And we're like, oh, my gosh, where is he taking us? And he walks past all these people and takes us all the way to the end of the platform. And then he stands there with a very pleased look on his face. And he says, you go, Veen. You go first class. And Tom's going, who is this guy? And so suddenly the train pulls up. There is one first class car. It pulls up directly in front of us. And the guy just turns and smiles at us like, see? And then he picks up these heavy bags and throws them on. He says, you get on. And we're like, no, no, no. You, you know, so he, we get the first two on and Tom gets up there to put them, you know, in, into the train. And I said, the guy probably wants money, honey. Give him, give him some money. And, he, and he, he throws the next two up and Tom's got money in his hand and he steps off the train and the guy is gone. There's no place for him to go. He couldn't have gone that way. He couldn't have gone that way. He couldn't have gone into the next cart was four cars down. He couldn't have gone under the train. He was gone. And we looked at each other and we went, oh my gosh, that was an angel. Have you ever had an encounter like that? How many think God will send angels to help us? How many think we need help? <laughs> I need help, guys. I need help. So I want us to stand up together. We're going to pray in the spirit. Come on up. Yeah. So 2021, Pastor Greg was praying in the prayer room and he started talking about how God was going to teach us how to dance the dance of the Maha Naim. How many remember that? Maha Naim. And I had actually just read that morning out of Genesis where when Jacob was coming back into the land, he names this place Maha Naim because he encountered a company of angels. And he named the place Maha Naim. You know what Maha Naim means? It means two armies. See, there's an army in heaven and there's an army in earth. And we got to learn how to dance together. So here's how we're going to do it, okay? 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, though I speak in the tongues of men and of angels. So when we speak in tongues, we may be speaking an earthly language, we may be speaking a heavenly language, we may be speaking an angelic language. How many here are filled with the Holy Spirit? Those of you that aren't, we want to have people pray for you at the end of the service so that you can get a prayer language. And then it says this, it's so, so here's what we have to understand. When we're praying in tongues, the, the Holy Spirit may be anointing the language that angels hear. Okay? Psalms 91 says he'll give his angels orders concerning you. He'll give his angels charge concerning you. Another translation says he'll give his angels orders concerning you. So is it possible that when we pray in tongues, 
angels are getting orders. So we activated this one time in a congregation over in Mississippi. And I said, I want you to choose an area of breakthrough. I want you to believe God for an area of breakthrough. Every, every, does everybody here need breakthrough in some area? If you don't need breakthrough in any area, you can pray for us. Because we need lots of breakthrough, okay? Okay, so I, this is what I said. I said, choose an area and let's pray in the spirit and let's believe that God can send angels to assist us, to break us through, to help us. Come on, how many think, are, are we on good theological ground? Okay, so... This is what, what we did. I, I said, well, let's just try this. So there was a couple in the second row, and we know them quite well. But what we didn't know is that they had a family member, her niece, had suffered a traumatic brain injury at work. And she was in another state, in a coma, on complete life support. Young woman in her 20s, two small children and a husband. And that afternoon they were going to be disconnecting her life support because they said she was brain dead. And they joined hands together and they said, Lord, help us. Send help. So they joined their hands together and they prayed in tongues, just like we're getting ready to do, just for a minute, to pray in tongues, to activate angel armies. Okay? Listen, I don't know. Sometimes you don't even know what you need. Right? You don't even know how to pray. But they just said, God, we need help. We prayed in tongues for like two minutes, closed the service, and as they went, we, we all went to lunch. As I'm getting in the car in the parking lot, they run up to me, and they've got their phone, and they're waving their phone at me. Pastor Jane, Pastor Jane, look at what just happened. They said, while we were praying in tongues, and they told us the story of their, of their niece. While we were praying in tongues, she woke up from her coma. Doctor said there was no brain activity. She was completely 100% on life support. While we prayed in tongues, she woke up from her coma, started pulling the tubes out of her body, and said, would somebody please get me something to eat? And at that point, I thought, you know what? We have not been accessing a resource that God has given us to fight, to war, and to win, and to break through. So all across this place, and if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, I want you just to pray in your own language, but we're going to pray in tongues and we're going to ask God to help us. Just take hands with somebody and come in agreement. We, it says in Scripture that when you're praying the Spirit, you pray in a language you don't understand but is fully communicating in the realm of the Spirit the very things that need to be tended for. So if there's something in your heart that you're just believing, I need an angel of provision. I need an angel of recovery. I need an angel to be sent with messages to be, uh, or an angel that brings healing or whatever it might be. Let's just agree that as we speak in the Spirit, that it's going to speak into issues that we don't even know how to pray. Father, we're contending right now for the breakthrough, the angels of breakthrough, the anointing of recovery, the things that you want to bring forth. As we pray in the Spirit, we're asking for you to even release angels on assignment to begin to work the dance of the Mahat Naim, the angel armies and the armies in the earth co-laboring to bring forth kingdom breakthrough. Give the Lord a shout, a praise, a victory. Father, let it be. Let angels co-labor. Let angels be sent. Let angels work with us in this hour. Then we'll give you all the praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and for your angels on assignment. We'll give somebody a hug of love, vision, nation. We're glad you joined us today. If you would like further prayer, want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, come on down. Our teens will be happy to minister to you. Thank you for being with us today.
And please, uh, those of you over 50, please don't forget to sign up for the Valentine's dinner. And then Pastor, Nissi, Pastor Missy has in the back as well, she has all of your contribution receipts. If you'd like to see her over on this side of the church, just go by, by the flag, and she will get you your contribution receipts from last year and get you that information. Please sign up for the Valentine's dinner, and we look forward to seeing you there. Come out on Wednesday night. We're going to continue our teaching about angel armies. Remember, Paul Renfro has a book on the unseen realm, which would be a blessing as well. Lord bless you.